Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good sorry to interrupt your eating, but we're going to go ahead and get started with the program. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Kashkari. I'm the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and I'm going to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Uh, it's really my privilege and pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. John Williams, who's the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Uh, John is a, I'm going to explain to you in a second here, is really a distinguished economist and leader at the Federal Reserve System. John did his bachelor's degree at Berkeley, uh, if that's not impressive enough, his master's degree at Oxford, if that's not impressive enough, his PhD at Stanford, all in economics, and then joined the Federal Reserve System at the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., where he did very important research on uh, monetary policy. After uh, several years at the Board of Governors, he went to the San Francisco Fed, and he ended up becoming a research director of the San Francisco Fed under then San Francisco Fed President Janet Yellen. And when Janet Yellen moved to Washington, D.C., John was selected to be the president of the San Francisco Fed, where he has been for the last five or six years. And as Tim mentioned, John has now been selected to be the new president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and which is a great, uh, he's a great choice, and I know he will do a great job. So let me just share with you three quick things about John that you can't read in his bio. Uh, and these are all positive things, John, don't worry. Um, <laughs> Number one, uh, John is very easygoing, great, uh, just very collegial person. We just had a town hall for our employees at our bank where we did a wide-ranging Q&A, and John loves taking questions. So uh, I know he's saving a lot of time for taking questions from all of you, so please don't be shy. Uh, he really does want to engage with you, which I appreciate. <clears throat> Number two, speaking about John's research, you know, I'm a, an engineer, not an economist, but if I were to be a researcher, you, you kind of want to pick topics that not everybody else is already focused on, because if everybody's already focused on a topic, it's unlikely you're going to discover something new. So 20 years ago, John and some colleagues started working on a really obscure topic about monetary policy that really seemed out of left field. Well, it turns out 20 years later, it's enormously important. And so at the Federal Open Market Committee, when we're discussing interest rates every six weeks, a lot of the discussions that we're having are about concepts that John helped pioneer literally 20 years ago. So that was really prescient. And truly, John is a monetary policy expert. Uh, and so I'm excited that he'll share some of his ideas there. And then the third thing is John has a good sense of humor and is an active sports fan. And while each of us, when we come to the FOMC meetings, each of us comes exceptionally well prepared to talk about the economy. John usually tries to weave in a little bit of San Francisco sports uh, into his commentary, which is usually very well received. Though I do remember one case where he had some obscure reference, and I remember looking across the table and seeing Janet Yellen and Vice Chair Stanley Fisher whispering to each other, not knowing what the heck John was talking about. Uh, so in the transcript that comes out five years from now, there may, there may be some commentary that's not entirely clear. But in any case, it's a real treat for us to have John with us here in at the Minneapolis uh, Economic Club of Minnesota uh, today. Uh, he's going to do a great job, and please join me in welcoming John Williams to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. Um, the, the part of the story that Neil doesn't uh, tell because he was being nice is the fact that I've been accused by my colleagues to cherry pick the data to support the notion that a 12th district uh, Federal Reserve sports team, if they win the championship, that's actually good for the U.S. economy. <laughs> so uh, I try to get the whole country to come or together uh, at these critical moments in sports to uh, do what's best for the whole nation. Um, and that would be support the Warriors right now, by the way, just uh, if you know. Okay, so uh, great, it's great to be here. I've had a great uh, visit uh, last evening, and then at the Minneapolis Fed, we had a great kind of very open mic uh, town hall meeting, which was a lot of fun. And I'm really pleased to be here with this group. Now, one of the things is I know that this group every year meets, has a Fed president speak to you, and so you're used to hearing about the economy, monetary policy, and interest rates. I'm going to take advantage of that fact, and and talk a, uh, take a step back a bit, and that's I'm going to talk about where I see interest rates going, but not just think about where interest rates are going, say, uh, over the next few months, but really think about where uh, interest rates may be going over the next several years, and and discuss some of the uh, economic factors that are really causing a change uh, that's taking place in the economy. 
And one of the factors, um, uh, key factors in my thinking about monetary policy is something uh, called R star, with uh, President Kashkari made reference to this, so a topic that a number of us in the Federal Reserve started studying about, like, uh, about 20 years ago. Um, so my goal for my talk today is to get you uh, to, get you to uh, find this interesting, this topic of, of, of R star and, and what it means for monetary policy, um, and think about what it means for uh, uh, the direction of interest rates more generally. Now, I've, all, I've already referred to interest rates and monetary policy a whole bunch of times, so it's really important that I give the standard Fed disclaimer, and that is everything I say reflects my own views and not necessarily anyone in the Minneapolis Fed, the San Francisco Fed, the New York Fed, or any Fed for that matter. So this is just, uh, again, my own, uh, my own take on, on the uh, issues ahead of us. So what is this R-star notion, and why is it so important uh, when it comes to thinking about interest rates? So what I, when I call R star is what economists call the natural rate of interest. So think of this as the real interest rate expected to prevail in an economy when it's at full strength. So while a central bank like the Fed uh, sets short-term interest rates, this notion of this natural rate of interest, or R star, is a result of longer-term economic factors beyond the influence of our central banks uh, and monetary policy. Now, uh, as... Uh, President Kashkari mentioned that uh, my fascination with this topic of R star and natural rates goes back uh, two uh, decades. So I really hope that by the end of this speech, you'll be at least one tenth as excited about this topic as I am, and then I'll feel I've done a good job. So let me get, let me go right to some numbers, and that is uh, that my view is this notion of a R star or natural rate of interest today is about half a percent. So what does that mean? So let's say let's assume that inflation is running at the Fed's target rate of two percent. That means that a typical or normal short-term interest rate in the U.S. economy will be about 2.5%. So let's put that into historical context. A 2.5% interest rate is an incredibly low level. In fact, it's two full percentage points lower uh, than what a normal interest rate looked like just 20 years ago. And importantly, this is not just happening in the United States. When you look across the globe, you see that this idea of R star is declining in Europe and Japan and the UK and Canada. And if you look at a, a measure of the global normal real interest rate uh, across the advanced economies, that's actually a bit below this half percent. Again, much lower than we've experienced through our lifetimes. Now, our star matters a great deal because it anchors where short-term interest rates are likely to uh, tend in the future. In a world of a low R star policymakers, banks, businesses, households, we all need to plan for lower interest rates than we've experienced during our lifetimes. Now recently, some economists and central bankers have pointed to some signs that the fortunes of our star may be uh, set to rise. Now, I wish I could join in this optimism, uh, but I don't see yet, yet see convincing evidence of such a shift. The longer run drivers still point to a new normal of a very low R star and relatively low interest rates for the uh, foreseeable future. So I've already mentioned that R star is determined by longer run uh, structural factors that are outside the influence of the Fed or other central banks. So what are those factors and how do they uh, influence the fortunes of R star? So the three key global uh, developments have caused this natural rate of interest or R star to come down uh, in a number of advanced economies over the last two decades. Changes in demographics, changes in productivity growth, and heightened demand for safe assets. Changes in demographics affect our star on a number of levels. We're living longer, and over the past three decades, life expectancy in developed countries has risen by nearly five years uh, and is expected to keep rising in the future. And, and the economics of this is when people expect to live longer, they tend to save more for retirement. This increased savings puts downward pressure on interest rates in our star. So with more savings, that pushes uh, interest rates globally down. And despite the fact that we're living longer, labor force growth in the United States has slowed, largely due to baby boomers retiring and a lower fertility rate. In fact, if you look at the forecasts that economists have put out, they expect labor force growth in the U.S. to be only one half a percent per year over the next decade. And that's well below uh, the average in, in past trends. So fewer, fewer people joining the labor force means fewer people working producing, consuming, and that tends to reduce growth and, less, uh, in, and leads to slower growth, less investment, which in turn drives this R star lower. The same thing is happening for productivity growth, which has slowed uh, compared with earlier decades. 
back in the 90s and early 2000s in the United States, productivity growth fueled by the internet boom and new technologies averaged 2 to 3 percent per year. But since the recession, productivity gains have, have hovered around 1 percent in the United States. Now, I do have a pet theory about this, is that despite all the new technologies, everyone's using them to play Candy Crush instead of doing productive work, but I don't have the data to support this hypothesis. But to be serious, productivity growth is influenced by technological innovation, and that's notoriously difficult to predict. Back in California, where I live currently, uh, you know, there's a, a sense that the world is being reinvented uh, every week. Uh, but again, if you look at the hard data, not only in the United States, but in other advanced countries, we really haven't seen a noticeable pickup in productivity growth in any country. Now, while I can hope that the next game-changing uh, innovation is around the corner. Of course, people are thinking about artificial intelligence and, and machine learning and things like that. For the moment, at least, the data indicate the productivity remains stuck in low gear. Now, the third and final factor that's been holding down R-Star is the high global demand for safe assets that we've seen develop over the past two decades and really goes back to the, the 1990s and has continued through um, the, this decade. And this has tended to drive down the returns on treasury securities and short, safe short-term loans uh, relative to those for riskier investments like corporate bonds and equities. And that, therefore, this has pushed down our star as well. So where there may seem to be a disconnect is so far I'm talking about kind of a gloomy assessment about demographics, productivity growth, and this demand for safe assets. And that may come to, to many of you as a surprise given how well the economy has been performing of late. We're now in the second longest expansion in the history of the U.S. economy going back to the data from the Civil War. And like most people, I'm very positive about the outlook uh, here and abroad. So let me put some numbers to that. Last year, US, G, uh, US GDP grew at 2.5%. The unemployment rate is the lowest we've seen in 18 years. And inflation is nearing the Fed's 2% goal. So this is a very, a very good situation we're in. And the latest data indicate that the drop in inflation, for those who are following this, uh, in 2017 was, in fact, temporary. Now, I personally am very happy about that because I've been spending the last year arguing that inflation was going to come back this year. That was a temporary uh, decline, and it's good to have at least one of my predictions come true. Um, now, looking ahead, I think the economy is on a really good um, uh, basis. I expect the expansion to continue, with growth averaging around 2.5%, both this year and next year. Um, and there are a few tailwinds that are fueling this solid economic performance. These include strong financial conditions, solid global growth, and fiscal stimulus. In fact, the International Monetary Fund recently put out their numbers for global growth, and they estimate the global growth is a little under 4% last year, and expect similar numbers for growth this year and next year. And these are all very impressive figures. So it's these strong tailwinds, the sense that the U.S. and the global economy is really coming back. Uh, they're leading some people to argue that the days of low R-star may be coming to an end and that interest rates might move back to more what we would think of as normal, historically normal levels. But as I said, I find that this optimism is sadly misplaced. So let's go back to the, three, the trio of demographics, productivity growth, and the global demand for safe assets to see if those changed to help us think why uh, this world of low interest rates is maybe shifting. So when it comes to demographics, one of the stories you hear is it's really the kind of blaming the, the baby boomer generation uh, in terms of the, that that's one of the reasons that labor force growth is so slow is because of the retirement of the baby boomers. And once all the baby boomers like me have retired, then the data will go back to former trends. Um, but that's, uh, that misses an important point. A research by my colleagues at the San Francisco Fed and others has revealed that they see really the increased longevity and this increased propensity to save that's a key demog demographic driver pushing down interest rates and low R star. And, and those are not about to reverse. And people living longer and saving more, well, those are good trends. I want to see those continue. But again, from, a, from the point of view of what's it mean for interest rates, uh, they are bad news for the fortunes of R star. Now, the second thing I, I hear discussed is there's more po uh, cause for optimism about productivity growth, um, in part because of the uh, fiscal stimulus, in particular the, uh, the tax cuts. So, of course, in principle, if businesses have lower taxes, uh, ta then they'll have greater incentive to invest uh, capital equipment, invest in research and development, and those are all positives for driving productivity growth, and I agree with that. But 
the resulting effect on R star is likely to be relatively modest. By my own calculations, we can expect the fiscal stimulus that's been passed to increase this R star or uh, normal interest rate by no more than about a quarter percentage point. So it is a positive influence, but a relatively small one. So why is the effect of fiscal stimulus so small in, in terms of its effect on interest rates? Well, one is, is in, in part because the tax cuts are front-loaded. Uh, a lot of the effect on growth is going to be in the next few years, and the effects on longer-run growth will be somewhat smaller than in the next few years. In addition, it's really important to remember this notion of R star or what the normal interest rates is not just determined by the United States. We live in a global financial system um, uh, with global flows of capital, and it's really about the global conditions of supply and demand for funds that affect R star. So a bump in U.S. growth, that's good. That's a positive for us. It's a positive for global growth. But if other countries aren't also seeing this increase in growth, um, then the effect on the, the real interest rates around the world is likely to be modest. So that brings me to this third story, that with the global economy doing better, people feeling maybe a little wi more willing to take on risk, that that should uh, reduce this global demand for safe assets, which was one of the factors pushing down interest rates. And I think in theory that makes sense. The leading experts would are, you know, have been somewhat puzzled by the fact that there's still this global uh, demand for safe assets. But when you look at the data, uh, there doesn't seem to yet be any significant uh, shift in this trend. Uh, and so again, I think that uh, the, the, the in, uh, heightened demand for U.S. Uh, specifically uh, safe assets uh, is still continuing. So there are these three issues. There's demographics, there's productivity growth, and demand for safe assets have all pushed interest rates around the world to very low levels. And uh, they all point also to an R star that's set to hold its position low in the sky for quite some time. Now, this you know, R star may not be the thing that gets you excited and get up in the morning uh, until you've had your cup of coffee, but I've got some more interesting uh, things to talk about in terms of what, what are the likely path of interest rates and monetary policy for the next couple of years. So following the global crisis, the Fed cut interest rates to very low levels. The goal was to stimulate the economy and get it back on its feet. Well, now that the expansion is well underway, we're in the process of normalizing monetary policy, and that, of course, means raising interest rates. If you look at the distribution of our projections from the FOMC participants back in March, um, the center of the distribution has uh, th either three to four rate increases uh, as appropriate for, for this year as a whole and a few more increases over the next few years. Now, I personally view this to be the right direction for monetary policy. At our most recent meeting early in May, we decided not to change the interest rates, but that's consistent with our gradual, pol uh, gradual process of policy normalization. Importantly, even as we raise interest rates, it's, I'm conscious of the fundamental drivers that govern this R star and that they're, and they're lower than we've seen in the past. With the new normal of, of short-term interest rates of only 2.5%, uh, interest rates are likely to remain low relative to historical experience. So in conclusion, it's important to distinguish between the, sh the current strong economic conditions, which are very positive, and the key longer-run uh, drivers that are determining interest rates. So I'm always keeping an eye on both the short-run economic outlook, but also these longer-term factors that define more the more fundamental changes occurring in the economy. I don't have a crystal ball, so I always let the numbers uh, inform my opinion. But for the moment, our star continues to shine brightly, guiding monetary policy, but holds steady low on the horizon. Well, thank you. So should, should we sit? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So thank you for those wonderful remarks. Uh, President Williams, I'm sure there's a lot uh, of questions in the audience. I'll ask the first one while uh. our spotters uh, get into place. Uh, so you talked a little bit about inflation, but could you say a little bit more? Do you think we're bound to see low rates of inflation for a long time? So when I went to grad school, uh, the thing I was told that I would be focused on in my career was high inflation and how to bring inflation down. And all of the theories and models we studied was you know, how to deal with the very high inflation that obviously happened in previous decades. In fact, low inflation is a challenge that not only we face, but in, in uh, Europe and Japan and many other countries has had inflation uh, consistently below their desired levels. 
Um, I think the U.S. actually were a bit ahead of the curve as we were in our expansion. I think in part, in large part, between the very be, because of the very stimulative policies the Fed uh, did, we've managed to get the economy back on track. We've managed to get inflation back to two percent. Um, I still am not ready to say mission accomplished. I don't think I'll say mission accomplished anyway, but we're, we're, inflation is you just barely reached our 2% goal. Uh, I, inflation's been running uh, below our goal for years. I, I do want to see a sustained increase in inflation around 2%. We've emphasized at the FOMC, which is very important, the idea of symmetry of our goal. It's okay for inflation sometimes to be a little bit above 2%, a little bit below 2%, but we want it on average to be at 2%. And I feel that we're, we're in a very good position to see to accomplish that over, over the next year or two. Um, I'm not really worried about higher inflation yet, even though the economy is really strong with unemployment below 4%. Wage increases have been, I think, more or less consistent with what we're seeing in inflation and productivity. The inflation pickup we've seen is really consistent with an economy that's kind of running at, at a uh, you know, very strong economy, but not one that's overheated, overheating at all or signs of overheating. So I would say that my views on inflation have gone from more kind of worried about the downside, which is what you were asking about, to being more balanced. So we're, we're just trying to maintain what I think of as a Goldilocks economy, inflation around 2%, you know, an increase in wage, you know, good increases in wages, and a very strong labor market. Um, the, you know, the challenge for us is uh, really just keeping the economy, continuing to grow uh, in, in the way it has been and, and keeping it you know, in, a well, uh, in a good balance. Um, I do think that, uh, get, getting a little philosophical here, I think all central banks should be really thinking hard about the lessons of the last decade, about how hard it's been to get inflation up, back up to where we wanted it to be. So, like I said, when I was in grad school, I was prepared to deal with high inflation. I think we all need the re rethinking not only our models and our analysis, but also rethinking more fundamentally our approaches to monetary policy so that you know, we can manage a world where low inflation may be uh, an ongoing ch uh, challenge. Great. So let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, spotters. If you could uh, give your name and affiliation uh, and then ask your question. There we go. My name is Paul Grand. Yep. My name is Paul Grangard, and I'm with a new company called Circle Rock. I, I'm always curious, why do we want 2% inflation? Why isn't, why isn't our goal stable prices? When I was in economics classes, I thought we wanted stable prices. So why, why do you come to this 2% number? Yeah, that's, that's a terrific question. You know, honestly, I think we don't, ex we don't uh, explain this as well as we could. I, I personally feel this way. Um, because I think it's a it's a great uh, it's a really good question. So there's so we are we did decide back in 2012 at the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, and we've renewed this uh, commitment every year that we want to see on average over the medium term a uh, two percent inflation rate. Uh, the Federal Reserve Act says stable prices, uh, but it also says maximum employment. So the answer to the question is first of all on the inflation that we know that for technical reasons the economists understand that the inflation rate overstates how much inflation there is because of just measurement and, and technical challenges. So that probably means that the true inflation rate is actually a little bit less than, than what we're measuring. But I think the more important reason is we have this dual mandate, which I you know, firmly support, which is maximum employment and price stability. And we know that if we had a 0% inflation rate or a half percent inflation rate, something very low, we would run into two challenges in achieving our maximum employment goal and our growth goals. One would be that we would be at the, hitting the zero lower bound issue where interest rates, because inflation is low, interest rates are low, we would be challenged in, in order to stimulate the economy during recessions. As we saw in the last recession around, around the world, where central banks you know, are limited in how low interest rates can go negative, and the Fed, we didn't even go negative. And so if with a very low inflation baseline, a very low R star baseline, it would mean a central bank, the Fed, would not have as much room to stimulate the economy in recession. The second is we know from research that there are distortions around deflation and very low inflation. Uh, firms, and we have all the micro data that shows you, shows you this, uh, firms are really reluctant to cut wages. So when you're in a world where wage and inflation growth are very low, you get this problem that b businesses basically are not able to adjust the wages uh, in, in accordance with uh, uh, economic conditions. Having a little bit more inflation in the background greases the wheel, allows those wages uh, to adjust without them actually being cut. 
We also know that deflation, declining prices, carry with them a lot of costs in terms of uh, businesses or households with debt and, and other decisions. So really it's this balancing act of we want maximum employment, we want very low inflation, you know, closer to zero. If we go all the way to zero, that will make it harder to achieve this maximum employment. If we have inflation too high, that carries with it a lot of costs to society. I mean, I lived through the inflation of the 70s, I, and we know that harmed households and, and the people in America a lot. So this 2% was this, you know, kind of uh, compromise or magic you know, kind of uh, point in the, in the middle. It's not written in, in stone, but it does reflect, I think, a good, you know, trying to accomplish these two goals uh, over time. Uh, so that, that would be my answer to that. Question here? Uh, <clears throat> Ron Schutz, Robbins Kaplan. Uh, John, I'm, I want you to put your mm -hmm. economist hat on with the on the one hand and on the other hand. And what's the other hand argument that interest rates are actually going to rise faster than mm -hmm. you think they are? Mm -hmm. what, what would what would people on the other side of that debate say? Uh, well, I think I can. You know, I don't have to go to a different person. I, I'm very. My view is data dependent, right? So if the data uh, evolve and the economy evolves in a different way than I'm expecting, so what did I say? Two and a half percent growth. I see the unemployment rate getting about 3.5% by early next year, uh, and the economy with about 2% inflation. So that's kind of my baseline view. Well, say that you know, the economy uh, just outperforms that. Growth is much stronger, unemployment comes down more, and we really do see a big pickup in wage and, and price inflation, much higher than I expect. Then I think it just makes sense in that circumstance that we would need to adjust interest rates faster to stop some kind of uh, obviously undesired uh, significant rise in inflation. Um, so that's, that's one example I could see, but it would really be based on the economic uh, evolution of the economic outlook or a shift, uh, a more fundamental shift uh, in terms of where, where I see the economy going or, or where interest rates need to go in order to achieve this goal. So I, I view the risk as being pretty balanced. So when I say, you know, I, I, I said that, you know, the center of the committee saw three to four rate increases total for this year. We've already done one of those. Um, and a few more over the next few years. I mean, that's kind of a baseline. Uh, if the economy underperforms, we'll go slower. If the economy really does uh, outperform this or inflation does pick up faster than we expect, then obviously we have to adjust to that. Uh, but it would really be not based on a shift in our strategy, just a, a you know, response to changing uh, circumstances. Next question. There we go. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the uh, appetite for safe assets worldwide, and I'm wondering what you include in the definition of, of safe assets. Yeah, so this has been an area of, of a lot of research of the last uh, 15 or so years. Uh, you know, Ben Bernanke uh, wrote a, a really famous uh, paper, uh, gave a speech on this global savings glut that I think was one of the earlier ones that pointed this out. So I think what, when we look at safe assets, basically these are the assets that global investors want in case of a negative economic uh, uh, you know, event. So U.S. Treasuries. Uh, the reason it matters for monetary policy is that reserves held at the Fed or at other central banks are, are a safe asset. Uh, they don't change in value. Um, they, you know, uh, they're very liquid. So it's really highly liquid. Uh, low risk assets, and importantly, assets that into that for the long term and the expected returns that shareholders should have. So uh, I'll I'll take the. I, I actually, I mean, you know. Um, uh, President Kashkari has heard me talk about RSO a few too many times, but I will say in, in the public, um, this is something that I think has been underappreciated in a lot of businesses, in pension funds, and in, in these kind of long-run issues. I do know that financial markets have kind of caught on to this, bond markets, things like that. Uh, my concern is that a lot of corporate uh, you know, uh, shareholder groups or corporate uh, leadership is still thinking, I've got to hit this old uh, mark for what my return on equity is. And, that some, and you know, those expectations have not shifted 
Because remember, I'm talking about longer run fundamentals. I'm not talking about monetary policy, easing interest rates or raising interest rates. I'm not talking about short term things. I'm talking about things that last over decades. And the productivity growth slowdown, which is true in, in almost all the economies in the world, uh, the, the demographics, which is true in, in you know, most countries in the world, and more, even more dramatic than the US, quite honestly, and this global demand for safe assets, if it continues, uh, these are things I think will be around uh, for quite some time. So my answer to you is that you really need to be thinking through what's a realistic return uh, on assets, what's a realistic you know, cost of capital and things like that, which I think have changed. Now, I, I get, you know, one thing I've noticed is in surveys of economists, this view of what's a reasonable return on equities and reasonable return on other investment classes has been coming down, but that's definitely lagging. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, the reason I kind of have part of my speech is really a kind of get out there to the business and leaders, uh, business and other leaders, to, to really think about these consequences. Another question? Yes. Here we go. Hi, Joe. Tesmer, U.S. Bank. Um, wondering if you could speak for a second just to the interplay between um, changing bank uh, liquidity regulations and the demand for safe assets and the ultimate size of the Fed's balance sheet and how do you think about evaluating what the, you know, what that terminal rate is as the balance sheet runs off and, and when, do you, when do you stop that runoff? <laughs> Those are a great a bunch of questions, and obviously inter interrelated. So uh, clearly, one of the things coming out of the financial crisis is a, one of the lessons is that banks, especially the largest banks, need to have liquidity. That means having on your balance sheet assets that you can, even a very stressed, very panic, kind of driven uh, situation, uh, uh, sell into the market to, to, have, uh, to have cash, basically. So again, going back to the great, the great question about what's a safe asset, this is the things that banks have to hold in the U.S. and other countries. It's reserves with the Fed, it's, it's U.S. Treasuries, it's other similar instruments that are highly liquid and, and, and highly safe. So there's no question that part of the reason that the demand, global demand for safe assets is still very high is because of regulatory actions in the United States and other countries which have told banks, hey, you need to hold a lot of safe assets. So that's, that's part, of the uh, part of the equation. I would say that you know this story about the demand for safe assets is, predates that, but it kind of comes out of the Asian financial crisis, uh, the Russian default, and the Euro crisis, and a lot of other things. So I would say that the regulatory kind of demands on liquidity provisioning are, are, are part of this, uh, part of this um, I, but I don't think it's the whole story because I think it predates it. In terms of the ultimate size of the Fed's balance sheet, we are shrinking uh, the balance sheet. We're now uh, you know, a little over $4 trillion uh, in our balance sheet, and we started this process uh, last year. It's continuing this year, uh, what I would call organically. Basically, we're just not reinvesting uh, all the proceeds of our, uh, you know, the principal payments from uh, uh, our holdings. My own view, and this hasn't been decided by the FOMC about exactly what our size of our balance sheet will be, um, and the ultimate size, but the, the drivers of this are pretty clear. First of all, on the liability, it's going, to be, it's going to be driven by the liability side of our balance sheet, not the asset side. So what are the liabilities of the Fed's balance sheet? Well, we currently have $1.6 trillion in currency outstanding, which is the Fed's liability. Great business model, by the way, if you can get into it. It's a zero <laughs> interest bearing perpetuity uh, that you can invest in, in other things. So $1.6 trillion on currency. The U.S. Treasury has a bank account with us, which they have, uh, uh, you know, they hold uh, 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 account with us. That's a liability for the Fed. There's obviously uh, the reserves that the banks want to hold for the liquidity reasons and for other reasons. So the question that you think about is: our balance sheet today, you know, today is over four trillion. But if you look at currency, uh, treasury, and probably liquidity demand, you're probably all the way up to $2 trillion or something like that anyway. So this compares to about $850, $900 billion of a balance sheet before the crisis. So let me go forward in time. So we're currently a little over $4 trillion. As we shrink our balance sheet on the asset side, as we stop reinvesting in this, we'll see the balance sheet shrink quite a bit over the next few years. And the question is, it won't, I mean, the, the point I'd like to make is not going to be as small as it was, uh, $850, $900 billion, because the currency and these other things have grown. 
The question that we don't know yet is how much kind of reserves do we think we, is, a, is efficient uh, for the conduct of monetary policy. So there's been some projections that have come out of the New York Fed uh, based on some uh, you know, surveys of people in, in Wall Street. And the typical example uh, would be currencies at 1.6 uh, today, 1.6 trillion, it's going to continue to grow maybe 5% a year over the next, say, three years. Uh, there's other ass these other parts are going to be bigger than they were in the past. And about two, three years from now, the balance sheet will get to about $3 trillion, and then we're going to start getting to that range of, is this about the right you know, size for reserves, the size of the balance sheet just for the conduct of monetary policy? Well, you know, that's kind of in the ballpark of around that plus or minus. Then the balance sheet will start growing again because currency will continue to grow. But this exact answer to your question is, is it $3 trillion? Is it you know, two point, uh, you know, two and three quarters, three and a quarter, something like that. It's something that we're going to have to learn about as we go ahead in time and see, you know, what are the demand for reserves and, and also for the FOMC to really decide exactly how we want to conduct monetary policy in the future and what the right amount of reserves is. Two points I just want to make, it's going to be a lot smaller than it is today, but much larger than it was in the, in the past. See questions over on this side? Oh, there's one back in there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Kunshan Kedia from U.S. Bank. Could you comment on European monetary policy and the outlook for the euro? And the what? And the last part? Outlook sorry. for the euro. Oh, so I am uh, uh, old and wise enough to not to comment on my, about my colleagues' uh, monetary policy <laughs> uh, <laughs> or the, well, the future of the, of, of the euro. Um, but I, I will comment on, on how I see things in Europe and in, in my own impression of what's happening. First of all, Europe. Uh, was uh, especially uh, the countries in the eurozone were you know hard hit not only by the global financial crisis which spilled you know across the, the globe but also uh, the euro crisis and all the political uncertainty about their banking uh, sector and all those other issues so I think the big good news in Europe is uh, it seems like they're getting uh, finally getting uh, really good traction on growth things look a lot better in uh, Europe their inflation numbers are still quite low but seem to have both um, you know, stabilized, but also showing some size of improvement. So I'm actually pretty positive about Europe, and, and I think that's consistent with what the ECB is doing. They're continuing very stimulative monetary policy, both with very low negative interest rates and also their, their version of quantitative easing, which I think is, has helped uh, get their economies back on track. They're, they're, they're gradually starting to pull back from how much stimulus that they have, and, have, and down the road they'll decide you know, at some point when it's appropriate to cut back on stimulus. Uh, but I do believe that the, under the leadership of President Draghi that uh, you know, the ECB has taken really bold actions, uh, uh, very, you know, for a lot of us unconventional you know, monetary policy actions, and those have been very helpful. Uh, and I think that's one of the signs of that is that, you know, the economy is getting better and, and uh, the euro has strengthened as a result of a stronger European economy uh, over, you know, so strengthened over time. And I, I think that's a positive. Uh, and I think it's, it's actually been helpful for the global economy, obviously, for all of us to kind of get more, a little bit more synchronized. Uh, back in the day, the U.S. was, a few years ago, the U.S. was the one economy that was actually recovering. The Fed was starting to raise interest rates while other economies were struggling and actually cutting interest rates. Well, today, except for Japan, I think the direction of economic growth and, and monetary policy is moving you know, a little bit more uh, to being po uh, aligned or uh, more coherent. And I think that's gonna be a po that is a positive for global uh, growth. Next question. Hi, Bryce Doty at SIT Investments. Uh, <clears throat> when Powell uh, testified in front of Congress in February, the uh, head of the House Finance Services Committee, you know, started off criticizing the Fed's policy of paying interest on the two trillion dollars of banks' excess reserves that's been going up, you know, roughly with uh, the rate of Fed funds. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sympathetic to the politicians' concern that it looks like you know they're incentivizing banks to hoard cash rather than lend, as well as it becoming increasingly costly. Uh, but I was really struck by his final comment where he said. You know, when Congress made the unusual, took the unusual step to allow the Fed to pay interest on reserves, it was not meant to be used as a tool to get the, the actual Fed funds rate to match the target. So is there, as Congress is kind of rolling back some of the post-crisis policies, if they, if they decide to go back to the way it was in 
say, you know, you can't pay interest on these excess reserves anymore. What kind of implications would that have for monetary policy? So I think it would have uh, very negative effects on monetary policy. So we are using the fact that we pay interest on the reserves that banks hold uh, on account with us to raise interest rates. I mean, the, as we've been raising the federal funds target uh, over the last few years, the way we've been ex implementing that is by raising the interest that we, rate that we pay to banks for reserves. We've also been raising this uh, overnight reverse repo rate that's the bottom of, uh, you know, uh, kind of a corridor there. The idea is with higher interest rates out there in the market, what we're willing to pay uh, to counterparties means that you know, uh, market interest rates move up. And that's been completely successful. Market interest rates have moved up one for one as we've increased interest rates over the last few years. Uh, w that's how we're operating monetary policy. Uh, it's been, I think, successful in terms of you know, uh, doing what we always want to do, which is basically change you know, financial conditions to support our dual goals of maximum employment and price stability. So this has been operating very well. I would argue that it, it doesn't really cost the taxpayers money because when we pay interest on reserves, on the opposite, on the, those reserves are obviously matched by assets that are tre generally, you know, uh, a lot of them are treasury uh, bills and bonds that we get the interest on from a taxpayer point of view. You know, in the end, the Fed in this program of QE and having all these reserves has been profiting, uh, you know, somewhere between 70 and 100 billion dollars a year, which we've been turning over to the U.S. Treasury. So it's, it's not costing the taxpayer money to have the large balance sheet. Um, if they took away the, pay, the ability to pay interest on reserves, uh, it would make it uh, very difficult for us to raise interest rates given the amount of uh, assets we'd have in our portfolio, uh, that, which would force us to take actions to uh, be able to you know, have the interest rate where we want to be, which I think would be very disruptive uh, in the short term. I also worry about something uh, uh, in, in the longer term is that, you know, in this world, I'm just going to go back to this point I was making earlier, in a world where normal interest rates are only like 25 to 3%, I do think that the Fed, in trying to accomplish our goal of keeping America working and keeping inflation low, and stable is going to, going to have to turn to quantitative easing or asset purchase programs or other approach unconventional policies. And for those to work and to be able to unwind those in an orderly, effective way, you need to have the, a tool of something li in, like interest on reserves for that to be successful. So I worry about it in two ways. If you took away our ability to pay interest on the reserves, I think it would be very disruptive in the short run, given that that's a critical tool for our policy. But this, in the long run, I'm concerned about it would basically make it much more difficult for us to do quantitative easing or policies like that when that next downturn happens. In my own view, this is again my personal view is that quantitative easing, although not perfect and you know there's a lot of uncertainty about its effects, was a important part of the monetary easing that we did uh, during the crisis and recovery to help uh, the, uh, you know, achieve our goals. So I think we're ready for the last question and over there. Thank you. Terry Sly from Briggs & Morgan. Um, I think one of the big issues probably in a lot of Minnesota company boardrooms these days is the prospect of tariffs, retaliatory tariffs, and the effect of trade wars. It's not really the Fed's wheelhouse, but could you comment on what preparations the Fed can make to deal with trade wars and how adequate you think those responses could be? So, as you said, it's, this is not a responsibility of, of the Federal Reserve, and I'll just make a plug for independence of the Fed. You know, we do have, I'm not an elected official, obviously, uh, we have, uh, we really value the fact that we have the independence to make uh, our monetary policy decisions uh, on our own without you know, direct uh, uh, direction from Congress or the administration, uh, focused on our, uh, I think, the long run health of the U.S. economy. And so I kind of work under the, you know, live in this fantasy world where if I don't comment on administration and congressional policy actions, they won't comment on the Fed. Uh, <laughs> that hasn't played out quite so well, but uh, I will be serious. Uh, I do worry uh, quite a bit around uh, the po potential effects of a, a true trade war, not just small adjustments of tariffs here or there or, or renegotiating agreements. Uh, those we've lived through before, and hopefully those can be resolved in a productive way. But if you really thought about the U.S. economy today 
and about how reliant we all are, whether you're here you know, in Minnesota, whether you're in California or Florida, wherever you are, we are so reliant on trade for uh, the uh, supply of our goods, the export markets for our for agriculture, for so many of our products. Um, and we're so integrated into the global economy that if we really saw a, a, a huge increase in tariffs or restrictions on trade, I think it would be very damaging to growth, to very damaging to the productivity of our con uh, economy and its long-term prospects. And also would obviously be inflationary. Let's not uh, fool ourselves. If you put large tariffs or quotas on imports, it's just going to make U.S. Uh, goods, you know, good. I mean, the goods that we import from other countries much more expensive, and that shows up in the pocketbooks of American consumers. So, again, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the, any, into the politics. I hope, but I think from the long run perspective, uh, you know, a, a global economy with more free markets with. Uh, uh, is, is better for us uh, in the long run and we, you know I think there are some real negative potential negative consequences of a, of a pro prolonged significant uh, uh, trade war so let's hope that does not happen Stage your photo. yep thank you president Williams and Chris for this enlightening discussion. As is our tradition, we want to give you a small gift to thank you for coming. Uh, so with that, help me thank once again President Williams. Thank you. So this brings